Okay, wow. let's say you don't release so him. What do we do? What, wait, 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 hold on. Who does Israel negotiate with right now to make peace with the Palestinians? I think there has to be an emerging leader from after the Arabic coalition. Some sort of movement between the West Bank and Gaza. Is there any Gaza talk about this? Is there any that. talk about this right now whatsoever? Like, are there any Arab states that even want to get involved in the show of a project? I feel like if the Arab leaders had your oh. brain, they did. Why would they have ever negotiated with Begin? Yes. Although to be fair, that was was that Carter at the time. That was a heavy U.S. pressure as well, though. Um, hey, what's up? It's a good story, boss. How are you? Yeah, well, not as good as your story. I'm doing great. How are you doing? Oh, or I just asked you that. Wait, are you back home yet, or are you still in America? No, oh, I'm back home, yeah. Oh, what's up? Yeah, I'm just uh, getting adjusted to the time change very quickly, but I'm managing. Mm -hmm. Slept for like 18 hours with a couple of wake-ups in between, but it was fine. Okay. Well, what's up? What do you want to talk about? Um, so, I maybe misread this. It felt like PV maybe didn't want too much conversation to be devoted to Israel-Palestine because I guess that's maybe where Biden is getting a bit f***ed in the progressive uh, vote, but eh, I just thought I'd defer it to do it today instead, after the event. But I suppose I just collected a few things that I thought you were maybe going a little bit off on, or uh, maybe just needed more elaborating on, so... Sure, my but, brain is huge now. So, yeah, yeah, so I've heard, yeah. Um, how are you, how's your book going? Uh, I'm almost done. I've got like two short chapters left, 40 pages. Okay. I'll maybe get to that one in a minute. Uh, I've seen you. I think it's so far. I think it's, I think it's a really well done, narratively done book to show the constant stream of failures from both sides. At least of anything I've read so far. I think it's, it's, just, it's a really interesting book talking about the political figures involved and then like why Israel couldn't accept peace here, why the Arabs couldn't accept peace here, what are the conditions that have to be met for peace to be possible, you know, what are the missed opportunities. I, I just think it's a really well done, like balanced on both sides, at least from what I've seen of it. I don't know. I haven't seen any huge criticism of it. Yeah, go okay. ahead. Yeah, I'll probably ask a few things about that in a minute. Um, I saw you've done like maybe three or four videos now or segments about uh, human shields, so, uh, mm -hmm. specifically the human shields policy in 2002, 2005 that was kind of hit by the Israeli Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. Where are you on that now? Um, I, I'm guessing this is going to come up. I'm pretty sure this is part of Inquest into Martyrdom. I think it's going to come up in the Finkelstein book, so I'll probably do some deep dives on it. Um, my understanding is that what would happen is when the IDF were performing military operations on the ground, um, according to them, what they found was that knocking on the door as the IDF increases the risk for some hostile firefight and people to end up getting killed, generally Palestinians. Um, so what they started doing is they had a policy where when they were in the area, what they would do is they would try to grab a civilian and say like, Hey, can you go and knock on this person's door and tell them that the IDF is here and can you come out like basically? Um, and that was the policy. Now on paper, that seems fine. Um, supposedly I haven't dug into this. I'm regurgitating headlines right now. Um, supposedly there had been times though, where Israel either commandeered people against their will or people felt like they didn't have a choice. And I read one story, one headline, I haven't done deep dives in any of this, where supposedly a person was sent into a building that they thought was booby trapped mm -hmm. to make sure that it wasn't going to explode. Um, in cases like that, I would say that it's obviously not okay. Um, but I think that it's, even if that was the case, it's measurably, diff measurably different than like Israel had a policy to employ human shields until 2002 or 2004 or whatever, but yeah. So, I think 2002 was a temporary injunction, uh, and it there. So you're suggesting that it was like more, most like a voluntary thing, uh, rather than that, that's how the idea of policy it. presented it. Yeah, but is, then is the that how they presented like, it before 2002, though? Because the impression I'm getting, and it's only from one or two articles, is that mm -hmm. after the injunction, they said that they would no longer use human shields, but they would only limit it to volunteering, which suggests that it wasn't voluntary before 2002. Is that not? Is that oh, I that. You, you can, you, okay. you can link me that. We can read it right now, though, if you want. Yeah, but also, it's a, I'm probably going to be a deep dive thing later. So Yeah, it's a pretty short article. But what I've got here is basically them saying that um, after 2002, they're saying they're not going to use human shields, but we're going to just do volunteer stuff for um, like uh, wanted Palestinians. But then also you've got like, uh, I think it's, it's either the Supreme Court themselves. I mean, they called it human shields at the time. But mm -hmm. it's either Supreme Court themselves or affidavits from soldiers saying that there is basically, it was Judge Barak, the guy who went to the ICJ, him saying that it's basically like, how can this ever be free will? Um, and then sure, there's like yeah. soldiers joking about the idea of like, well, who's going to refuse a request, quote, request, if you've got yeah. soldiers at 3 a.m. pointing guns in your face? So mm -hmm. um, yeah, and uh, this is something maybe 
I'll look for it at some point. But at the end of this article, uh, which seems to be based on the Supreme Court case, is them saying that other uh, methods they used included uh, ordering civilians to pick up suspected bombs, another one mm -hmm. being used, uh, literally grabbing a civilian and firing over their shoulders, and another mm -hmm. one being uh, commandeering family homes and using them as military posts, but keeping the families in there to discourage any counterattacks. So all th my understanding is all three of those would be explicitly not okay. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, all three of those, yeah, that's it. Those would be all explicitly not okay. The question is, were those a result of a practice of policy or were those individual instances of soldiers acting improperly? Well, that's I that's what I don't know because it's saying, it's mm -hmm. just saying here that they've used them in this, in this variety of situations, but... When the IDF that literally said that they were going to stop it, they were going to limit it to volunteering. So that's where it suggests, like, that's why it suggests that before then their policy was very much involuntary, crazy sh but, Yeah. Huh. Yeah, I don't know. I'd have to, when I dig into it, my, um, yeah, when I dig into it, I'll get more information about it. Somebody posted in chat yesterday. So I'm, I'm telling you where I'm getting this from, so it doesn't seem like I'm not, like, too married to this. Somebody posted in chat yesterday that in the history of them using this policy, literally only one Palestinian ever died doing it. Now that doesn't exonerate it. That still mm -hmm. makes it bad. If what you just said, if those three instances happened and that was true, like even if they had a hundred Palestinians check for bombs and none of those were bombs, that's still a hundred different instances of using a human shield, of conscripting a civilian to work for you to prevent harm from your people. That's still bad, even if they weren't. But um, I there is there are worlds. It's so annoying because nobody's good for anything like this. There's a world where. I would technically think that not only would that be a good policy, even as a Palestinian, you might want that policy. I think I read a story or whatever, or I read an example of like, let's say for instance that your son or a family member, the IDF wanted to talk to them, right? And you were on your way home from a grocery store and you saw some soldiers that were kind of like outside your house. And I see that they're about to go and knock on my door. But a soldier came up to me and was like, hey, listen, we want to talk to your son. Do you want to go knock on the door and tell him to come out? Or do you want us to do it? Mm -hmm. I would much rather do that. I would much rather do that than, than the IDF barge in or whatever fucking bullshit might happen there. But um. Yeah, but I mean, again, it's the question is like, how did it play out circumstantially? If it was the case that only one Palestinian died, that seems to point in the direction that maybe it was a good policy. But if what you're saying is true, that um, because human shields, I don't think you can use human shields against like Hamas, but against like civilian populations, I think the IDF could absolutely use human shields. In the West Bank, you don't want to kill your fucking family members to kill uh, IDF soldiers. Hamas might want to, but not civilian mm -hmm. Palestinians. Uh, it could definitely be an effective deterrent. So yeah, but I, I'll, I'll dig into it more. Yeah, yeah. That's the the same article I'm reading is saying that yeah, one was killed, some 19 year old, after being forced to knock on a Hamas guy's door, and mm -hmm. then the rest that some wounded. But yeah, mm -hmm. um, do you know if the I haven't been able to find this yet? But do you know if the actual Supreme Court case or any of like any summary of this what the Supreme Court said themselves is out there? Because that's I'd I think I read the article, dissenting yeah. opinion. Okay. And I think the dissenting opinion, because there were three, they were short. These were like paragraph or two long, I think. So maybe it wasn't even the full thing. Maybe they're just clips of it. But I think the dissenting opinion was the guy, I, I want to say he basically said like, yeah, I can understand we'd want to ban this because it looks bad. But like at the end of the day, all we've done is we've made Palestinians less safe because we're trying to give into some political thing to look better. But yeah. yeah, I've heard. And I think it was um, the National Religious Party said that it was like um, making t life harder for everyone. But uh, yeah, it seems to be one of those things that very much like the left were in favor of the ban and the right wingers were like, no. So yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the way that you had phrased it earlier was just like that the policy used to be, well, we'll just ask them to volunteer. It seems to be the case that uh, soldiers and the Supreme Court themselves basically viewed it as coercive, at least until 2002. Uh, so but that yeah, well, the possibility, but I think I even said that when I mentioned it because that I think that was one of the chief criticisms. It was like, well, how much consent does a Palestinian mm -hmm. actually have if there's like seven IDF soldiers standing there, you know, with M4? It's like, you know, hey, do you want to go knock on that door? I don't know. It'd be interesting to see stats on like, I don't know if the IDF collected it, how many people agreed and how what was the fail rate? Like, what if, if only like 10% of people agreed? Well, it doesn't seem like there's that much coercion if there was, but if it was like the it was like 98% agreed, it's like, okay, well. Either it was a really good idea to cooperate or they really felt compelled to do it. Like, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I, I, don't have, I don't have a lot of conviction around any of that because, that, like I said, that'll be something I dig into around the... Uh, yeah, because I, I can see the argument with uh, the fact that it might be more violent if you just have them banging the door being, IDF, open up, like rather than just like yeah. using a decoy or something. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Like I'll even probably... if the police were to come to talk to my son, I mean, my kid's 12, but like if he was like 18 mm -hmm. or something or unruly, like I would absolutely want to first pass at talking to my kid to tell him we need to go out and talk to the police rather than the police like barging in. Mm. Um, I don't know, we're all white, it's fine. But like, I, I would definitely want the opportunity to do that. But yeah, I mean, I could say it going either way.
Okay. Also, something that I'm really stressing when I'm fighting with people is there's a big difference between policy and bad behavior. So, like, for instance, somebody tells me, has it ever been the policy of Israel to, like, intentionally target and kill civilians? My understanding is no. It's never been that policy. Or at mm -hmm. least in the past 30 years, it's never been that policy. But that's a, that's a way different question than has an Israeli soldier ever committed the war crime of targeting and killing a civilian? If I had to guess, I would say almost for sure. Yeah, I'm sure that's happened several times or dozens of times or maybe hundreds of times hopefully not that but but most likely yeah um but there's a big difference between like a soldier did a bad thing that they never should have done versus like the policy of the military was to engage in this behavior right well it seems to be that since 48 the israeli thing has been like even if they want to do something they won't make it policy right even in 48 when they quite clearly wanted as many arabs gone as they possibly could but it never became policy right it was always just mm. like yeah you know, um, i would disagree i think it literally was policy right and f because remember during that civil war and the ensuing war they were like take 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 as much territory as possible literally that no, was not the taking whole territory plan. i mean yeah, yeah taking uh -huh. territory that yeah that was definitely a goal no one can test that but uh -huh. expulsion as far as we talk about policy depending on how you define policy um it was much more of a kind of like we're going to communicate this understanding from the top down right so there will be areas where like ben gurion would be in a meeting of like what do we do with the fifty thousand people in lida and ramla and he's just not saying anything but then they go mm -hmm. outside for a cigarette break and they ask him and he just waves his hand as if to say Fuck them all off and then they do it that's what i mean by like uh mm. was it policy so technically no, it wasn't like the government from the top down, but there was very much understanding. There was very much like no one's going to get reprimanded if you do it. Uh, you can be very loose with how you interpret hostility in Plan Dalit. And then just like uh, different commanders from like sort of the middle down giving orders like that. Yeah, that's more how it works. That's what I mean by policy, though. Interesting. Yeah. I'd have to I'd have to dig more there, but I, I think I disagree. I think it was explicitly the policy for expulsion, destroying villages. Um, like Dar Yassin wasn't like a one off like, oh, my God, how did this happen? Like, I'm pretty sure they explicitly said like, yeah, we're going to shit up. And our goal is to literally make these people never want to come back. And, you know, these people like after the 48 war, when there were Palestinians from Gaza that kept trying to sneak back into Israel, um, mm -hmm. with the, some were committing crimes and terrorism. But I think most of them literally just wanted to, like, go back to their homes or set up shop again, like near where their village was. If, they, if it hadn't been overtaken by, you know, a kibbutz or whatever. Um, the policy at some point was like, kill all these people or like go back over the border and like destroy them so hard that they don't want to come. And this was like, I'm pretty sure the outspoken policy of the IDF. This wasn't a secret. And yeah, yeah. Over the, and over and over and over again. The barring of them coming back was policy policy yeah 100 percent um i guess yeah i I, it's, I think it's mostly just a semantic thing when it comes to the part like the idea of whether the expulsions were because for plan dalit the argument against that not being a quote expulsion policy was that they would say that it was more to do with uh villages that presented hostility for example like on roads that they couldn't get their like uh resources towards and then trying to consolidate just like uh secure passage between cities and then they would uh expel people on the basis of like hostility rather than uh just a blanket policy of expulsion but that's, that's kind of where the big dispute Come. so it's like whether or not this had been like a premeditated and planned ethnic cleansing or whether it was actually just sure. like a, an understanding that was communicated from the top down in a kind of like unofficial way because ben Gurion's whole thing was very much like we he didn't he didn't want to be ever seen in history as the great expeller so he can be like look at everything we're saying uh and look at all these orders and all these documents we're not saying kick out all the arabs like it's never that it was never that simple but uh, obviously they were doing that but just in a more I yeah, think, unofficial way yeah i think the issue the frustrating thing is that um like the 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 arabs in general at least up to 73 and onwards like they they just managed to make exactly the worst decisions every single time mm -hmm. which gives israel a pass on so much stuff so like or i wouldn't say a pass actually but i would say like so for instance um uh the nakba right what would have happened if all of those Palestinians hadn't fled. Because my understanding is for the majority of the Nakba, the, the vast majority of them fled because they were worried about their villages getting destroyed, right? Yeah. What would have happened if they would have stayed? Like, I think it would have been really awkward for Israel to deal with. Like, do they keep them there and have like this demographic challenge inside the newly formed country? Or do they actually expel them? Because for the Nakba, they didn't have to actually expel 700,000 people. Um, it was a fraction 
was it like 10%? Do you know how many? I think it was less than that. 10 Wasn't to, it like under 10 to, 10 to 15%. Yeah. Was it 10 to 15? Okay, yeah. yeah. That they expelled and then some and 600, 500,000 left on their own. What would have happened if they would have stayed? Well, we don't know. And we can't answer that question, unfortunately, now, right? So, well, I mean, some who stayed got massacred, right? So, like 25 ma minimum massacres after people stayed and surrendered. Um, sure, some uh, might yeah. have, but then a lot of them were integrated in and worked. And also, there was a lot of back and forth violence. Like, I don't know if they were all straight out just massacres because even. Well, I don't want to get too deep in it, but like even the mm -hmm. Dare Yassin thing, I'm sure that did that traveling Israeli, Israeli guy or Israeli traveler, whatever, did he debate you on that at all? He didn't debate me on it, but he made a response on it. I mean, he, he doesn't uh -huh. like he doesn't deny any of the facts of what happened. Like people were killed after surrendering, and the people yeah. who died in the fighting were mostly civilians. He didn't deny either of those things, but um, he sure. thinks it's not a massacre because the majority of the deaths happened in the context of a shootout. And then after yeah. the battle ended, 20 to 30, 40 people were killed but he doesn't call that a massacre. It's, it's retarded. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Um, okay. Yeah, it's like that's it's just it's just semantics. Um, but as for yeah, Dar Yassin was also quite an exceptional one because the Haganah didn't actually want to do it. They didn't consider that village to be militarily significant. They did. They uh -huh. considered that they had been making a good effort to keep the peace. Um, they originally the plan there was to expel them. That was what the Irgun wanted to do. But mm -hmm. obviously, people like they suffered too many. They suffered like a third of their forces having casualties they got really fucking mad and then they shot them uh, yeah a bunch of people were shot after surrendering but mm -hmm. um when you're talking about the people who would have stayed yeah that would have presented a massive problem but that's what i mean by the expulsion policy without policy is that like even in places like haifa where the official jewish line from the leaders was stay after the battle like we wanted the arabs to stay but mm -hmm. on the ground you've got the haganah who kind of don't want them to stay because they're kind of unruly they're it's difficult for them to consolidate control especially if you're preparing for a war so they would be very like uh, uh they would arbitrarily search people they would like have very uh poor responses to looting from the worst excesses they were just very very rough with the population so that basically just made them want to leave anyway right so um you kind of have like mixed messages even in situations where the official line is to stay um and also that's not to mention the ergon and lehi who were literally running around uh, occupied towns trying to get people to leave by terrorizing them sure. Yeah. Sure. um where are you now with uh, Arab war aims in the 48 war. I saw you were talking to one of my dudes about it yesterday. Uh, I think it was 100% territorial conquest. And then kind of with the secondary goal of maybe trying to expel Israel. But I think it was mainly the states were all just looking to expand their territories. So you're not really committed to the idea that it was like a, that they were wanting to genocide them or anything like that anymore? Um, I mean, I think they would have if they had the opportunity to. But I don't know if they had the ability to. And I, I think that... I think the primary goal was acquisition of land. Mm -hmm. um, I think a secondary goal was expelling all the Israelis if they could, if the war was going really well. Maybe a tertiary goal, maybe, would have been uh, genocide or establishing a Palestinian state. I don't know. But I think the first two were like way, 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 way more up there. Yeah. Um, I think I'm just going to give you my take and then we'll see what you say. Um, okay. I think as far as trying to say that the genocide i think you can if, if anyone's going to make that argument it's based on two things one would be uh the fact that none of the documents are released so we don't actually know what they were planning behind the scenes at all we can only guess based on public statements that are very sparse as far as uh -huh. genocide goes i always get skeptical about people uh holding on to just like one or two quotes you know that's the same thing with i guess the icj case right now with south africa um sure i think you mentioned it yesterday uh this idea the general secretary of the arab league saying that uh there's going to be a war of extermination and momentous massacre it'll be like the mongolian massacre or the crusades right that one um mm -hmm. but if you even look at the context of that quote which is probably the worst one is that the context of that is basically similar to a few quotes that he'd made a few years earlier and based and him saying that um there's the context of this time is uh jews and arabs both blaming each other for how a war is going to start and him saying that is basically just like hyperbole of him saying that like, of him trying to blame any war that starts on the jews and just saying he doesn't want it but even if you have a quote like that which is really really extreme and seems very clear cut mm -hmm. it doesn't really match anything else this guy ever said before like 
he said that a year before the war started. A few days before the war started, he was actually much more frequently committing to an idea of saying things like, um, we want uh, an Arab Palestine, but as for the Jews, the idea is that they just exist as an ethnic minority and, quote, they can have citizenship and be as Jewish as they like. And even for some Jewish majority areas, he was offering, like, autonomy. So even that... I would have, like, to, I'd have to see what that quote is. Um, my feeling for what you're referring to, that wouldn't surprise me at all. I don't think any of the early people cared about Jewish people that much. What they cared about were Europeans. Mm -hmm. I think that was the really scary thing, was the European settler project that was coming into Arab land. Not necessarily about Jews. And the and the Jew, the Jewish Europeans that were coming in here did not see themselves as Middle Easterners. And they wanted to set themselves, they viewed themselves as superior. They wanted to be democratic um, shepherds of, you know, of Western democratic values and shit into their new secular area. Um, and they saw themselves as better than the surrounding kind of like religious dogs or whatever. Not, I'm not trying to add like a racist component, but they just, they mm. very much saw themselves, I think, as Westerners or Easterners. And the, and the Near East people that were there definitely saw themselves as like the native people. And these are like European invaders. I yeah. But as far as w with this guy in particular, it, it seems to be that he had pretty decent relations with the actual European Zionists. I mean, even uh, Ben Gurion described him, and this is after the quote's been published in that newspaper that it came from. Uh, you've got Ben Gurion describing him as uh, the most or one of the most honest Arabs, uh, like Arab leaders to deal with. Like he called him like the most honest, the most humane, uh, like literally one of the good ones is how Ben Gurion described him. Uh, so mm -hmm. yeah, it's just that that's the thing as I always get was when people uh, there's this tendency that like once people have kind of got like a preference with like Israel or Palestine and then like the mm -hmm. levels of Watch charitability out. become very varied between the two groups. Right. Because I feel like if you heard this from a, like a, if people generally heard this from uh, a, a Zionist leader, there would be very much people wanted to hunt for context and what, the, what exactly that quote means and where it came from. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Something that a feeling that I had. So as I've done political research over the past year or two, um, one thing that I've been big on as I've been talking to people is I don't put much stock in quotes at all. Mm. Um, because like, show me a military action or show me an action of a country afterwards. Cause people say wild shit and a quote just doesn't mean anything to me. So oh. I'm so sorry. Excuse you. My Red Bull. Shut up. So, um, so what I would say is, um, yeah, so I'd say, okay, well, show me military actions or show me country actions. After, I don't care about the quotes. Uh, um, in, Sh in Shlomo ben Avi's book, he actually ups that a lot and has kind of changed my understanding even more such that like public speeches by politicians are incredibly tactical things. Mm -hmm. However, like what happens is, so one thing I used to fight about uh, um, relating to the Six Day War, or we can even talk about like 48, is I would say something like, oh, um, Israel wanted to preemptively strike because they felt like the Arab countries wanted to go to war um, and they were ready and preparing for war. And the counter arguments I get all the time is, well, no, they actually didn't want to go to war. They didn't want to go to war. And what I never considered was that both of these statements could be true from both sides at the same time. So something that Ben Amid talks about a lot is um, a lot of times Arab leaders would substitute aggressive rhetoric or would substitute war for aggressive rhetoric. Mm -hmm. So if their populations were unruly or they were getting restless or they hated the Israelis, then they would say, yes, we will kill them everywhere we see them. And they would ratchet up like the, the mobilization of the armies. They would ratchet up these like dumb little cross-border things, whatever they could to satisfy their population, but they didn't actually want to go to war. Um, so like my position right now for the Six Day War, for instance, I don't think the Arab states at that particular point in time wanted to go to war. They just wanted their population to think that they would so that they looked big and tall and strong. But Ooh. simultaneously, I think it's super fair that Israel looked at it and was like, these motherfuckers are going to annihilate us. Um, so I think that like a lot of these things can be simultaneously true. Um, when you talk about the general settle stuff, I don't think I would ever lean on a particular quote. I think the figure that I would lean on and the actions that I would lean on would be, one would be the Al Husseini guy, the Mufti, because mm -hmm. holy fuck. And then yeah. two would be the assassination of Abdullah, Abdullah the uh, first in, in East Jerusalem. I think when he traveled there after Jordan took over the West Bank, because I think the Palestinians there considered him. Uh, was that because he was unloyal because he didn't push far enough into the Israelis? He didn't do a good enough job or was making peace or not making peace. But like, I don't know if Jordan ever actually even fought Israel in 48. They I think did. they like took they fought, in, they fought in Jerusalem, but they didn't fight in Didn't they? Else, yeah, so. but they like stopped. Like, yeah. I think it was mainly the majority was like Jordan took a ton of territory and then they just like kind of chilled. They might have fought a little bit in Jerusalem, but that was like it. Yeah, um, because Jordan had the Arab Legion and of all the Arab armies, the, the Arab Legion were the only ones who had any success fighting against Israelis and mm -hmm. they weren't even really that committed to the war. So, as far as again, we're talking about Arab goals, the Jordanians wanted to take the West Bank 
and East Jerusalem, they didn't really want to do anything else. They didn't want to commit genocide. They didn't want to take any Jewish territory from the their side of the partition plan. Uh, they hated Al Husseini. He was it was it was Al Husseini's supporters who killed Abdullah uh, in fifty yes. one. Yeah, one of his um, family members, I think, yeah. or from that group of people. Yeah, and you're right about Al Husseini. Uh, but again, that also would go in the favor also against the genocide thing because the other Arab leaders, he like when he turned up to Arab League uh, and Arab Legion meetings, like he was he wasn't never he was, he was barely ever invited. He would just turn up. They all didn't like him. Um, to, even to the point that I don't even know, and this is something I get into arguments with people quite a lot, is like I don't even know how popular Al Husseini authentically was in Palestine either. Um, most of the population in Palestine was illiterate. It's like 50 to 70%. Uh, that whole crazy, that whole like nationalism of Al Husseini in particular was very much uh, an ideology of the upper classes. Most of them left before the war even started. And sure. when it came to Al Husseini, uh, Abdullah basically preferred living next to an Israeli state than next to an Al Husseini state. Like that was very yeah. open. That continued uh, into the into the two thousands, I think, where yeah. Jordan was more interested in forging ties because of all the stuff going on with the Palestinians historically and everything. Yeah. Yeah. And uh even local leaders, I didn't know this until quite recently, was that when the war was being when the Arab militias were being kind of diverted towards urban warfare because they were failing at the rural level, uh Arab local leaders from Haifa, Jerusalem, and Jaffa actually went to Egypt begging Al Husseini to leave the cities alone because they didn't mm -hmm. want the, the same kind of like uh, war to the end that he did. They they wanted because these were multicultural cities. They wanted to stay that way. So um, yeah, it's like I don't think people can ever uh, like exaggerate just how much of a like renegade Al Husseini was, even just like in terms of the because you know he was appointed right. He was appointed by the British, even though he only came in fourth for the position of mufti uh mm -hmm. as a political move even when he had power he worked very very hard and very aggressively to keep that power often against his like opposition in a very repressive way so in the arab revolt people who opposed the arab revolt were literally like chased around and murdered like one of the ways that husseini liked to kill his political opponents like fellow arabs was to mm -hmm. throw them into fucking pits with snakes and scorpions like so yeah. he ruled with a proper fucking iron fist uh, mm -hmm. And yeah, that's the thing is that like, yeah, the one leader who I think did have genocidal intent in the 48 war from the Arabs was mm -hmm. someone who all the other Arab leaders hated. That's why Lebanon I think that, barely got involved in the war. They only took like one village. You know, yeah. mm -hmm. I think that um, I, something that was interesting to me, there's a question that I'd asked a lot before is, um, oh, the, I just, all my thoughts just went to Lebanon. I lost, I lost. Oh no. Oh no, I'm sorry. Um, I might have even asked you this question. Actually, I think I asked you this question over the PV weekend. Um, why were Jews so good at like diplomacy and politicking versus the, either all the Arabs or the Palestinians? Like, I don't understand how they outmaneuvered them so hard. And um, there, it's there's such an interesting passage. Uh, it's a couple paragraphs that um, because uh, Benemy reflects on this. And he's like, you know, why? Why was this the case? And a really interesting observation that he makes is that as Israel is maneuvering from 48 to, to well, from 48 to the 90s, um, Israel's facing constantly the existential threat of elimination. Mm -hmm. That when things are getting really fucked, their back is against the wall and they're facing extinction. So it forced them at many times to be realistic about what they could achieve that Israel couldn't afford to gamble on idealistic plans. There were plenty of times where they had to make concessions, where they had to beg for help, or to do whatever they could to remain okay in the eyes of the United States, but they do all these things because they were constantly worried about being eliminated. And none of the surrounding Arab states or even the Palestinians ever really have that fear. They can always afford to hold out for the next deal or commit the next terror attack or wait for the next war. They don't need support from the West. Um, yeah. Even when they lost support from the Soviet Union, like they've got all the surrounding states to help them. And that that like pragmatic, imposition on Israel from the realities, from the conditions that exist on the ground might have been the thing that always pushed them towards considering more realistic options. And ironically enough, and then this feels good because it's funny, although I didn't realize it, but something I said before was more true than I even realized that people hyping up Palestinians are actually hurting them. And then Shlomo expands, expands on that by saying that like, Actually, yeah, people inflating Palestinian dreams to unrealistic heights mm -hmm. because Palestinians will never actually face extinction, will never actually face genocide, is always basically prompting them to fight for more and more and more and more. Because if they lose, well, they'll just wait till the next intifada or they'll wait till the next UN mission or they'll wait until the next whatever happens to give them another shot at it, basically. Yeah, yeah I think that's mostly a good answer. 
Uh, you did ask me at the time, and I had a banging answer, even though it's only... I never heard it anywhere else, but I think it makes sense. What was your uh, banging answer? It was that Zionism, even though it came from the 1870s, it was a modern movement. It was like... It had already been through it, it witnessed like the Enlightenment and all that kind of shit. So they were very modern in the sense that they were very meritocratic. They were very based on uh, talent. They were very uh, willing to represent people who would otherwise not be represented, right? Like women representation was uh, as par a part of the Zionist movement before it was basically anywhere in Europe, before the UK yeah. at least. Um, and obviously because <laughs> diversity is our strength, they were, yeah, they were very, though, like imagine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Imagine being woke, blah, 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 in fucking Israel uh, in the fucking 70s. Has yeah. Golda Meir a fucking woman as the prime minister in yeah. existential war? Yeah, and it's not even like a thought, you know? Um, yeah. And she, that, especially, yeah, like, she was uh, one of the chief, she was like the spearhead of raising funds in America and the UK for the 48 uh -huh. war. She was expected to fundraise $25 million for arms from Czechoslovakia. Mm -hmm. She came back with 50 million and then did it again yeah. in the same year. So, yeah, um, like that, but as, Unfortunately for the Arab leaders, they uh, their leadership was very much reminiscent of the Ottoman Empire, like a 500 plus year old feudal system that was yeah. all about families and who could take, uh, who just happened to be in the right place at the right time. You know, people like Al Husseini, you know, just like told can shit for brains, like racist psychos who um, didn't really have anything that much to offer their own people and were just considered with keeping their own uh, station. So I think that's a really big thing as well, is that the Arabs were kind of like, unfortunately, stuck with a lot of the remnants of the Ottomans, especially Palestine, because under the Ottoman Empire, the land of historic Palestine was actually kind of fucked even a bit harder than the rest of the Middle East. Like they were kind of abandoned. They didn't have like natural resources. That's why the illiteracy was so high. And the people who managed to take power out of that transfer from Ottomans to the UK, yeah, it was just families trying to improve their lot. And that's why you've also got like this phenomenon of nationalist leaders selling their lands to another nationalist movement that's planning to take it over. You know, yeah. Um, and I think a really good example of that was um, Ibn Saud, the king of uh, Saudi Arabia, and his contribution to building up to the partition plan I think it was the Anglo-American Committee of Inquiry that was considering what to do with the Palestinian state and whether, like, the borders and everything. And his mm -hmm. method of negotiating was taking these uh, British and American uh, politicians to where he was, to Saudi, and lecturing them about, like, um, how we have the power of the sword and w we got rid of the Romans, so we'll get rid of the Zionists as well, that kind of shit. Um, yeah. And basically just offering them, like really ridiculous bribes like he offered them like a golden dagger and a robe to each politician and then took them for a tour around his harem he offered one of the british politicians a wife like the chairman of the okay. committee Jesus. so i'm like yeah uh, yeah so yeah th that's what that's what i mean by like feudal fucking representation yeah. you know yeah that's um, interesting too because israel always tried to be somewhat empathetic no that's not true never mind um, I was going to say Israel tried to be somewhat empathetic and understand the, the desires and wills of other nations, but that's not actually true. They, the only ones they really understood were other Western nations, yep. uh, because Israel at multiple times did fuck shit with their Arab neighbors without realizing how stupid um, they were being. But yeah, the Arabs and like the, the old world, I don't know what you would say, versus like the Israelis and the European New World were definitely uh, at ends with each other. And you could see that in multiple points in the conflict. Yeah. Yeah. And it's also like the, the even the partition plan negotiations. Uh, Partly, they also did just have a little bit more sympathy from Western leaders. So I didn't even know this, that um, that partition plan vote might not have even passed with the supermajority that it required had it not been for US and uh, British pressure on smaller nations. I think it was Liberia and one other, uh, Greece, was it? Yeah, there were two nations that were literally like basically threatened with uh, economic sanctions to vote mm -hmm. in favor of the partition plan. And I think that was sure. the difference of whether or not it would have passed at all. But also like Possibly, when yeah. the UN was going was drafting the partition plan the zionists went there and buttered everyone up and uh bugged all the meetings so they knew what everyone was thinking what everyone wanted the arab leaders went there and just lectured everyone and didn't budge on anything so yeah, yeah it's but that that is the kind of phenomenon you get when you've got like uh autocrats versus people who are selected basically on a meritocratic basis yeah um, yeah which is why one of the people, I don't know if I brought this up or not, if I ever do an uh, autobiography or looking at, not autobiography, biographies looking at people, the Sadat guy in Egypt seems really cool. Of all the people I've learned about in the region, he seems like one of the bravest and coolest leaders to emerge, especially coming from an autocratic regime like that, yeah. Mm. But, um...
Um, okay. Anything else? Yeah, what else? Yeah, where are you on Ben Ami's opinions on Camp David? Was it actually a great deal or was it, uh, it was a bad amazing. deal? All of or... these were good deals. Okay. The Palestinians are fucked themselves over and over and over and over again. No, not the Palestinians. Kind of the Palestinians. Arafat was a terrible human being. Mm -hmm. Arafat was a garbage fuck human being. Yeah. What does Ben Ami actually say about Camp David in the context of if I was Palestinian, I wouldn't have accepted that deal? The problem... Um, when, when he's saying that I might not have accepted that deal, um, so what, what, what ben -Ami does throughout the book is he tries to say, like, what are the possibilities that somebody could have pursued peace at this time? And then he tries to say, so like, for instance, one thing that ben -Ami says is um, oftentimes peace can only come after a side has vindicated itself through military victory or whatever. That like, for instance, peace with the Arab states in a, in a conciliatory manner where you're taking territory from them after 67 probably wasn't possible. The conditions weren't right because Israelis were way too full of hubris and, and messianic hallucinations after winning wars and it humiliated the Arabs and that um, the conditions for peace probably weren't possible. But after 73, where the Arabs showed that they had some ability to stand up to Israel militarily and when Israel was finding itself increasingly worried about doing things, the conditions at that point might have been more correct for peace. Um, Israelis even though they won in their blitzkrieg fights, they didn't like war of attrition, where over periods of time they were losing people because Israel thrives on its military power, not on its uh, population that it can throw continually in, into you know, machine gun fire like the Arab states could. So he talks a lot of different points about like the conditions for peace were probably such that it could have happened here or it couldn't have happened here. Hmm. With Camp David, on the Israeli side, the conditions for peace were there. They had the negotiators, they had the government, and the government had an unbelievable amount of courage, even though they didn't have support of the population and they probably didn't have the political support of the home front, they were still willing to bank everything on getting that deal done. But Arafat was a man who always lived in paradox or always lived in ambiguities and he thrived in it because he was a celebrity, he was a diva, he made lots of money, he enjoyed to fight with terrorism, he, he always liked to employ all of these tools and never have a committed position at any point in time. And Camp David, it's possible that he never went to Camp David with even an end goal in mind. And he constantly fucked around with the whole process. Now, American negotiators, Clinton was weak and didn't understand the situation initially. Mm. Um, he, he wasn't the bulldog that Carter was, was a counterexample given. And um, uh, Ehud Barak and the uh, Israelis might not have gone in with realistic assumptions about, say, like Israel. Because initially when they went in, they were like, well, you know, Israel's, not, or not, I'm sorry, not Israel, uh, Jerusalem. That's not even on the table. That's not even yeah. a question about splitting uh, even the old city. Um, so they might have had bad things going in, but I think the Israelis really wanted, I think there, there was a chance that if it wasn't Arafat, if it was anybody else, there the Israelis were willing to do something there. And by the time you get to Taba, the things that were on the table were unbelievable. Looking at those maps, mm -hmm. the offers, the uh, refugee fund, like, oh my God. And, and he, and he, and Arafat still said no. So, I mean, like, what are you going to do? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the impression I got from Ben Ami was that he's, I think he is blaming the, uh, at least the American and partly the Israeli side for Camp David as well, because of just how scuffed a lot of the negotiation process was, the like lack uh -huh. of uh, understanding of what either side's red lines were, the fact that the Americans basically abandoned the talks for like a week at the beginning, um, and just kind of let them at, go between themselves. So I can get yeah. that. But yeah, when he talks about like Taba and Clinton Brown, just being like the big missed opportunity, I think I agree with that. It does make a lot of sense. Um, sometimes I hesitate before saying like amazing deal rather than just like the least bad one for Palestinians, I guess, because the way that they're going to see it is that it's always going to be we're getting 22% of the land at the end of the day. But yeah, fuck it. Um, yeah, I guess my understanding is that like Egyptian leaders and ambassadors, Saudi leaders and ambassadors, like the Arab world was like exasperated that Arafat really? was shooting these down and, and didn't want to negotiate and didn't want to actually make, yeah. Um, and the last thing I wanted to bring up was settlement expansion in the 90s and i think the way yeah, you describe it as only expanding within the settlements rather than making new ones no i completely take all that back oh okay, okay. why uh, i think that yeah it was a subhuman piece of shit and even under rabin the settlements continued to expand they didn't make new settlements but the way that they expanded settlements was a way more, um, what did I say, insidious? It was way more subversive than I originally realized. So yeah. for instance, they might not create a new settlement, but they'll say that, oh, well, this plot of land that's four kilometers away from the city is actually still part of this settlement, so we're going to build houses over there. Yeah. Uh, so like, yeah. And then there were a lot of like, 
um, there's that Y W Y E. There's like, y there River? were a couple of deals that were cut. Yeah, that were cut and uncut and shit. And yeah, I don't know. I'll, I'll dig into that more. But my my macro level broad understanding is that through the '90s, on the Israeli side and the Palestinian side, both of them were pretty shitty partners for peace. Um, mainly because <laughs> I would blame Arafat for how the Oslo Accords were negotiated. Were just the Oslo Accords. Ah, fuck, I hate to say this. I have a very negative opinion of the Oslo Accords now. I think they set the stage for everything to be really fucked. But hmm. um, yeah, the thing with the settlements is like it's it's also actually a bit it's actually a bit worse than that. They also yeah they they would recognize some outposts and they would actually like they would naturalize outposts and then link them to an existing settlement, even though yeah they weren't yes. really far apart. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think also they. Um, I've heard a few people mention this. When people compare the growth of settlements and during the Oslo period, they always just compare it to like uh, the one or two years prior to Oslo, which is really weird because that was the fall of the Soviet Union when un unprecedented. People will compare the expansion of settler populations in mm -hmm. the Oslo period to just one or two years before. You ever heard oh, that? Oh yeah, about? I read yeah, yeah. over all that on stream. Yeah. Someone's made a huge email on that, and it's super disengenuous. Yeah, it's because it's the fall like of the said, USSR. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so a ton of people are coming out. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, I think also Rabin did also expand settlements, but he at the very least made a conscious distinction between security settlements and political ones. He thought there were some settlements that actually had some security purpose and the other ones were just like, it was just for expanding territory. And he mm -hmm. explicitly only expanded security ones. The, he made uh, that distinction himself. And okay. uh, Barack didn't do that. And Netanyahu sure. definitely didn't do that. Netanyahu uh, yeah. expanded the definition of security settlements <laughs> in a very dishonest way. You know, like, you know that clip of him bragging about fucking the Oslo Accords with uh, Jordan Valley? Um, I haven't seen it, but it absolutely wouldn't surprise me. Yeah, Ben Ami talks about this as well. Is he talks about how the Israelis had a very exaggerated understanding of the security benefits of the Jordan Valley, like way in the east of the West Bank. And mm -hmm. Netanyahu expanded it even further to basically give Israel this like 20 year lease on the Jordan Valley way in the east of uh, the West Bank by defining it as a vital security interest, even though mm -hmm. It wasn't at all. And one of the things Ben Ami mentions is when he gets to the Clinton parameters, he kind of rejoices in the fact that Clinton and the most of the Israelis had finally acknowledged that this decades long like mythology of the security benefits of the Jordan Valley had been realized and then they were eventually going to get fucked off. And I think the time period in Camp David was something like six to 21 years of giving Israel a chance to move out of there. But then by the time they reached the Clinton parameters, it was just down to six because they realized sure. that it just wasn't as important as Israel was making it out to be. And Netanyahu, I think, was a very big part of that, was just like defining the security interest very, very um, like much further than it should have been. Yeah. yeah. The Judea and Samaria circle jerk bullshit and all the, the more religious extremism that started to show up in Israel post-67 is pretty unfortunate. It kind of fucks a lot of shit up um, and is really gross. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I hmm, yeah, no, run, fuck. You have there's a difference between like what's right and just in the eyes of like morality and international law versus like what's possible. I don't think it's possible, but I do think it would be just that a dismantlement of almost all of the settlements, at least the ones that aren't close to the that aren't like on the um, that aren't clustered together or whatever, should happen. I just the settlements are just so evil and bad and have fucked up so much for negotiating positions from the West Bank. And I don't like that, um, I don't think that Israel can have it both ways. Like, you can't have settlements in occupied territory, and so you're doing this because it's your land, but then simultaneously say, well, Palestinians can't vote because it's occupied territory. That can't be both, because that is just apartheid, right? Mm -hmm. it, it can't be both of those things. So, I don't know. I hate that settlement shit is so fucking annoying. I don't know what the final plan is there, but, um, yeah, the, the, the continued attacks and the cycle of violence, like, it's going to take a really brave leader and a lot of political will and a lot of good international pressure on the Palestinians and on the Israelis, because it seems like there's never been good, there's never been good international pressure on the Palestinians, um, because the only ones that would pressure them are Arab leaders who secretly, you know, don't like Palestinian leadership, but publicly would never say as much. Um, it's, yeah, I just, it's a really frustrating, stupid fuck situation. Yeah. How do you, but. how do you feel about the prospect of like uh, ANC style Palestinian militants encouraging <laughs> settlements out of the West Bank? 
encouraging settlements in like like i mean when i say a, when i say a and c style i mean obviously don't target the people but like if someone's going to set up a tent like like is it that bad if a fucking paraglider just comes and pulls it down <laughs> probably because just the violent shit just fucks everything up what the palestinians need right now is they need somebody that you can negotiate with it, it can't be a boss and it can't mm. be hamas um I, have we talked about that one leader barguti barguti yeah maybe yeah. that guy he's got some historic authority because i think he was a big like militant in the second intifada it seems like he's chilled the fuck out a bit as he's i don't know if he's still in prison now or at least i've mm. heard that in his writings he he's chilled out prison, yeah. and it seems like he's like incredibly popular um the is, is israel needs to actively work to empower the palestinian people to have a representative but the also but the also the other thing is that like i don't even know what the fuck that means when i say that because like what can you force elections on them Maybe that's just not their vibe. That's not their culture to have elections. So then, but then their representatives in the past are who? Al Husseini, Arafat, Abbas, like people that end up being corrupt, completely unpopular. Like even the PA under Arafat was incredibly unpopular. It was all fucking corrupt. None of the Palestinians liked it ever. So it's like, yeah, the yeah. thing with Bar it's it's actually quite hard to find that much about what Barkuti believes throughout now because. I know there's this thing about people speaking in different ways to the Western media than how they speak to Arabs. So I, I don't know how much that's an issue. Like an example, a good example is Hamas, right? Hamas will actually, what they, they don't say it's okay to target civilians. I don't know if you noticed that. Like in their 12 page report on October 7th, they literally say like, it's, a, it's an affront to Islam to target civilians and they just blame it all on Israel, right? Like, yeah, yeah that's their public I stance. I saw that yeah. report. But then you also have to be very careful about what it means when we say target civilians. Just like whenever I hear a Palestinian or a Muslim or a defender or whatever, whenever I hear them say things like they want to fight against the occupation, yeah. you have to be very careful because in our ears we hear, oh, that's kind of fair. West Bank and Gaza, no. For a lot of them, the occupation means the entire state of Israel. No, yeah, that's and true. Some, that's true. But I'm, yeah. I'm telling you that when Arab uh, media, when they discuss civilians, they don't they don't take the, like, you know that tanky thing, no Israel is civilian because technically it's settler close. Like, they don't, they yeah, don't yeah, talk yeah. like that. Yeah, Arabs are actually more, <laughs> like, Arab propagandists like fucking Hamas are actually a bit more competent than that on the world stage. Uh, they'll actually, they, they do acknowledge that there are Israeli civilians. They just blame it all on uh, Hannibal Doctrine and shit like that, right? Or, uh, and, and the helicopter fire. That's, kind of their yeah, position. Yeah, but then I yeah. guess, I guess, but I mean, like, clearly they didn't feel that way on October 7th. Yeah, no, they didn't. Really yeah, I'm just saying what, what they say publicly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The Which is why, ocean. yeah, when I think about, like, uh, someone like Barkuti is, he uh, obviously was a big voice of the Second Intifada. He believed that there has to be confrontation mm -hmm. alongside negotiation. He so um, Arafat, yeah. said he opposed killing at least civilians within Israel proper. He mm -hmm. um, said uh, he has recently called for a third intifada although his understanding of intifada is it seems to be a bit different from people like hamas he's also endorsed the geneva accords which is kind of like uh based on the clinton parameters so it would just be really interesting to see what he would have to say as a leader because he is very popular i don't think he could ever renounce violence completely but to control it in a more meaningful way maybe but i don't know sure bro we had it? people an attack about mitzvah come on now what, like, what? this the Barhudi, before, well, like right before he was in prison, he ordered an attack on like some girls' bat mitzvah, to uh, uh, some terror attack. Like the, this guy is. I mean, he, wasn't he's hold on, hold on. Wasn't my, wasn't Mandela literally involved in an actual civilian death before he was imprisoned and before he was finally released from prison, so that like he could be negotiated with and stuff? I think he was involved in some pretty radical shit too. There even were prior also to, uh, MK order. attacks on civilians that they took years mm -hmm. to own up to, let alone condemn. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not saying he he's a good guy. I'm just saying that at the oh. end of the day, they need somebody to negotiate with. And if he's the guy, and he, if he can renounce violence, like there has to be somebody, right? I I can see that, but the problem is, like, I think, especially after Hamas, the idea of propping someone up and then being responsible for propping up the next person that becomes the new Hamas or the new uh, uh, Yassin, like that. The, the guy who started Hamas essentially and started off was a he's an okay guy and then it just became Hamas. Sure. Also, this is what I wait, that, wait, 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 before we move on to that. Okay. Here's what I think. I think right now, I think Israel making a bad decision would be better than them making no decision because the status quo right now is unacceptable and is, is on a crash course I for, think, for destiny. It's something is going to explode at some point when these annexations start. We already delayed with the Abraham Accords, but at some point, uh, Netanyahu is going to want to start annexing the West Bank. Right, right, proper into Israel. It's not going to happen. That's my thing. Um, why? Wait. Why is this not like going to happen? A better pathway. 
because Netanyahu has almost no mandate from the Israeli people to do anything right now. That, that, was, like, literally like, the, that was literally the Dr. impetus for the Abraham Accords, was he was about to start annexing the West Bank. And I think I think it was Bahrain that reached out. Yeah, and yeah, was yeah. like, well, hold on, I'm let's chill. Saying, no, let's no, not I'm do not that. We can do peace it. instead. No, no, I'm not saying he didn't want it. I'm saying that it's not going to happen. That's all I'm saying. But like also, what I'd say is one, rather than like prop up like someone we know has been a terrorist already convicted. and like has called for the third intent, but we don't really know what that means yet. Maybe he means like only killing some civilians. Maybe he means like 30% civilians, but like we have a, a, an alternative pathway, I hope, in like having um, an Arabic coalition take over um, control and make them, their presence more seen which they seem to have said some, make some sort of promises oh, no, in the rebuilding of Gaza. I don't know point. how deep that's going to go, but I think going through a pathway of like having an Arabic coalition take control and like be a benevolent... You, how, uh, how does that work now, regime? though? Not to, unfortunately, um, at 2000 plus, now we have to start factoring in religion. When you say Arab coalition, Four you mean a Sunni coalition. Six. How is that going to take control of, of an extremist Islamist Shia-backed uh, Wait, no, government this... in Gaza? Uh, Gaza, is, Gaza is Sunni, like um, uh, and, and Hamas is Sunni as well. Oh, yeah. Wait, how, why the fuck the, do they get support? How do they rationalize it to get support from fucking Iran and he Hezbollah? And the Houthis are both the Saudi. Kill, yep, killing the, are. Yeah, killing the Jews is a very good unifying. Uh, oh, okay. Never mind. Okay, then. That would be a thing. Then I guess. Okay. Yeah, um, but another thing is that he, he brought up is I don't know why this keeps getting brought up. The uh, uh, what is it called? The Jordan Valley is like this. I, I I heard the claim that it's like mythological. The idea of how important, how like it's unshakable was I I feel like is what I was reading from uh Ben Ami when he said that uh, the mythological Jordan Valley, but it's made as like this un un uh insane idea that the Israelis wanted to maintain some sort of control over the Jordan Valley, which is like the border between Jordan and like. Uh, having some sort of control there. And then they eventually settled for some sort of uh, installations of warning systems. It's not like this was like this insane, uh, unshakable resolve that, that Israel would never give up. It's seen as like this thing is like, oh, this is the proof that the Israeli side was actually like unhinged as well in Camp David. Uh, I don't know why you're like bringing that up, and I, don't, I feel like you just heard the word uh, fucking mythological and then just ignored everything else I said. I literally said that it was exaggerated. I, I don't know what I'm talking about. You made it sound like it was a. It no, was I didn't a, make it like, sound like I said thing. exaggerated like three or four times. I don't know why you're, you're just. It's because I said mythological the first time and I read it in the book. You've just decided to stick on that for the rest of fucking eternity. And You've you been over this like three today. times. And yeah, because I'm quoting the book. You that shit today. Okay, as in okay, the okay, value sure, sure. of it, like, as in the exaggerated value of it was mythological. Also. Also, I. I which uh, you which are these? Uh, wait, 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 yeah, wait, wait. No. Um, I could be wrong. Okay. Uh, Barhuti was uh, charged with 37-something crimes. He wasn't convicted of all of them. Was the bar mitzvah one that he was convicted of? No, this was, like, after he was already sentenced. He already had, like, it, but it was, um, it was said that it was his attack that, that uh, was orchestrated on that bar that mitzvah. Allegedly, it was b before he was captured and uh, it was already set in stone or, or something I saw, but... Um, what about that? I mean, he still did shit in a terror. Yeah, he probably did. But, Whatever bro, I mean, hold on. The Israelis were... the peaceful kind? Wait, hold on. Yeah, but we've Israel, also... Israel, yeah, negotiated, Israel negotiated with Arafat for how long, bro? And, like, this guy was, like, the king fucking terrorist. <laughs> if they can negotiate with Arafat over and over and over and over and over again, they can negotiate with the That's, other dude. It's different to, like, install... Hold on. It's different to install a terrorist. No, 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 hold on, hold on, wait, 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 install implies doesn't have popular support, and you would make him the leader. We're not talking about installing anybody, it'd be releasing a yeah. guy who already enjoys You're pretty releasing wide to become one. Yeah, he's, that's not installing, he's, he's already enjoys, He's more popular like, than Hamas, bro, yeah, yeah. <laughs> still. He's more popular, he's like the most popular politician among the Palestinian people, that's not installing. Well, right now he's installed in a prison cell. Okay, wow. let's say you don't so release him. What do we do? What, wait, 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 hold on. Right Who does Israel negotiate with right now to make peace with the Palestinians? I think there has to be an emerging leader from after the Arabic coalition. Once that comes into power and they start, and then you can start seeing actual, like, good things happen. Like, some sort of calming of the situation and some sort of economic um, stability. And in, in a, like, a chilling of some of the restrictions on the Gaza Strip once the Arabic coalition comes in. 
some sort of movement between the West is there Bank and any Gaza talk about this? Is there any talk about this right now whatsoever? Like, are there any Arab states that even want to fucking get involved in this shit show of a project? From Biden said that they that they do want to uh, that the uh, Saudis and UAE have uh, uh, put up that they will uh, be a major player in the rebuilding of Gaza. That's what they, uh, Biden has claimed has been committed. Major by player the, in the uh, rebuilding might just mean sends money. That doesn't mean anything. You need like political that's, commitments. That's what I'm. That's what I'm not sure, hundred percent sure about yet. But I think that that I pray because like I feel like that's the only fucking way anything gets solved. I don't think the Bahudi method is going to go very well. Maybe it could. Let's say that the Bahudi method has like a a twenty percent chance of of leading to some sort of like peace. Um, I think and like a. 50% chance of, of like being way worse than our current situation and like a 30% chance that everything stays the same. And then I think the uh, Arab coalition has like a 50% chance of moving towards peace, actually even higher, like 70%. Wait, 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 wait. But what's the, what's the percent chance yeah. peace that an Arab coalition even forms? Again, do, is there anybody that actually wants to step up and do this? Like take political responsibility, not just send some fucking money. I feel like I if uh, the Arabs through had the, through the pressure of the US. I feel like if the Arab leaders through have like uh, I feel like if the Arab leaders had your oh. brain, they did why would they have ever negotiated with Begin? My brain or his brain? What do you mean? David's. Brain. Oh. What do you mean by that? My brain. Because Begin was a fucking terrorist. And the Arabs Literally. negotiated peace with him over the Sinai. Yeah, Although to be fair, that was with a lot that was I'm with talking, heavy was that was that Carter at the time? That was with heavy mm -hmm. US pressure as well though. Um, and that, well, the, that track started secretly too, um, but yeah, again, yeah. the point is, is um, we don't actually, we don't, we don't know what is... Farkuti believes, nor do we really know what he, what he would be like as a leader. It's just like compared to Hamas, I mean, it's a... it kind of got much worse, right? Well, you can, you can not have Hamas there. And I don't, and I don't even know, I really don't even know, um, if he would be better than, than an Israeli occupation That is saying something. When an Israeli occupation, like uh, West Bank style, would be a nightmare. Did I say Israeli or say Gaza? I don't know. I meant to, yeah, Israeli occupation over Gaza. But um, I understand the point of Barhudi, but do you want to move on to the, the 48 war, some of the contentions you had? Mm -hmm. Okay. So. Wait, no, no, wait. Hold said, on. I want to force an answer right yeah. real quick. Hold on. Fine. Do, um, Fine. wait, Go. if. If the Arab coalition doesn't form, what is Israel's responsibility going forward for making peace with Palestine? What should they do? Uh, everything's fucked. Uh, they should both get nuked, and they should all move. Good one. Move so any answers? Middle. Okay, you can't you can't contest any of our answers. Then, if you're gonna only give me my answer, if you have any other alternative, I'm not so doing the Arab guy. Okay, I'm not doing. No, I'm saying that the Arabic coalition should be forced, and maybe I'm not saying it's an impossible idea. I'm not saying that it's like this is the worst idea of all time. I'm saying that that is like. That should be like the absolute last uh, resort. I agree that that is a, that it is a possible solution, and I just don't think I don't think it's a good one, and I don't think it's any better than the Arabic coalition. That's all I'm saying. Oh, it is definitely way worse than that. Okay, I don't understand. I don't know if that okay. answered anything I just asked, but okay. All right. What'd what you okay? What did you ask that I didn't answer? If the Arab coalition doesn't form, because it doesn't look like it's going to, I don't know if we have any indication it will. Then what should Israel do to push for peace? How should Israel try to make peace? There is no Arab coalition, and if the Arab coalition doesn't form. I, I truly don't know. I think that the situation will be fucked because there is no way that Israel... Oh, if if you can't form an Arab coalition, maybe I would say, but yeah, fuck it, do Barhudi. If it, it's probably better than an Israeli occupation, just barely. I oh, Okay, fuck it, yeah. I would eventually say that. Okay. Okay. You drive okay. a Tesla? Uh, no. Oh, yeah. okay. I do agree with you. I think an Arab coalition or some other Arab states being involved I think would be really good, but okay. Yeah. Uh, to the 48 war, I was digging digging a little bit more and i was right there was a shit ton of um uh problems in the beginning of the 48 war um israel was deeply on the defensive and losing territory and regaining territory but losing again and then like just barely holding on to what they have and losing a couple of villages um and they only started to turn around after the first ceasefire they shipped in 50 million rounds of ammunition um, like thousands and thousands of guns and other artillery and, and things from Czechoslovakia. So there was a point um, at the beginning of the war for a while in which Israel was on the defensive and was not doing well.
So I didn't just make that shit up. Being on the defensive uh, doesn't do mean like any of that? being on the defensive doesn't mean the same as losing, though, right? They were on the def mostly the problem with the beginning of the Forty Eight War uh, until April was that they were struggling to move. Uh, Easy, like their equipment and supplies between areas because of the uh, attacks on the convoys, right? As far as losing yeah, goes, like that, they, 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 they were struggling to hold their, on to places like that. The, yeah. yeah, they didn't even have all of the the like the uh, forty seven and uh, uh, partition like land. They didn't even have any all like the majority of that secured at all. They had like maybe. Uh, 60% of the of the like partitioned land which was much smaller than like the even the after the 48 war land like that's all they had there and they were struggling to keep that so no i don't think that israel was this mighty warriors that were all organized that uh were ready to defeat all seven armies from the beginning i think there was a serious struggle at the beginning of the no, war no they weren't yeah and, they were they were um, outgunned definitely uh they were struggling to move supplies around the around their area they were also mostly struggling to hold on to places that were kind of isolated like the etzion block which is very isolated but as far as them like losing significant territory i thought my understanding even before the reason they decided to go uh more offensive was because they were kind of surprised at the arab failures to consolidate control around the rural or the rural parts they literally changed their strategy uh, quite early on to go from uh rural to raising antagonism in cities because they were failing and that was actually one of the factors in deciding to go offensive uh in april was check arms but also the fact that arabs were just like not as impressive as they'd expect them to be because arabs had a lot of equipment yeah. and a lot of uh shit but they didn't have they had a lot of planes but no pilots right so even with more planes, they commit. They were able to carry out like less than a quarter of the attacks that Israel did. Same with they had a lot of guns, but very little ammo. They had a, yeah, um, and also yeah, they were. The fact that, I would say I would say that they were outgunned. I think it's disputable if they were outnumbered from the beginning of the war or if they were already um, an, an advantage by that. But I think the it major, majorly came down to just being a skill issue of just not having uh, having as well of a organized army and communication between the uh, attacking armies. Or even the communication between the same army attacking. Yeah, I don't but think I've think ever heard general, that described as losing, idea, but yeah, difficulties for sure. Yeah. Um, I mean, they were losing territory, like not a lot, but they were losing, and they barely had were holding holding on to much to begin with. I, um, I I would have to watch like a documentary, look at a step by step of the early days. But my understanding is that like it was a little bit even. I think I would even take the uh, issue with what Lonerbox said, struggling to move supplies. I think there were times where um, was it Jerusalem or Tel Aviv that was like uh, no, it must have been it must have been Jerusalem or another city that was like more inland that was like under siege and for a while it was scary. I remember reading over and over again they tried to send like a hundred resupply trucks, like ninety seven of them were destroyed. Mm -hmm. But as soon as like the Haganah and everybody mobilized and started their shit, it was over that um that was, yeah that, that, that was 40... months into the war already though that but it might have been months in but i don't but they, it was on, just wait, before that yeah they didn't that that Haganah thing that was after they had a massive increase in the number of Haganah. i think it was like all the army basically had a completely restructuring and turned into an actual army and then um their their number doubled i think it went from like you an actual I army like Hold on, they had, didn't, they have, didn't they have fighting practice for 20 years leading up to this under the yeshuv hadn't I they been the, fighting for decades yeah, the, how do you mean they just organized like because they they actually did not they were just like a shit ton of like militias and shit um at the beginning of the war at least and there was a massive restructuring of the haganah between the first and the first ceasefire and after that and and the, all the arms but i think you should watch like some sort of uh like uh video of just like captures and, and like the war just to like grab in your mind but no, that what is, I would say that is, is that, true they were yeah they were in the middle because they didn't want to become an official army under the british because it was illegal so the uh, part of their defensive posture at the beginning was them like in the middle of organizing their forces yeah yeah and i mean yeah, like, when we say organized yeah they might have merged into the idf and everything but like they, it wasn't like a ragtag no, group of people like they were very combat capable mm -hmm. that didn't even happen but all that yet yeah, the that was completely after the war but what i would say is that that's true. They had some training, but so did the Jordanian army. The Jordanian army had thousands and thousands of British trained uh, troops, and they were f they were fucking up Israel for a while. At the nah, no, they no, wait, 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 whoa, 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 what's your timeline? I thought the Jordanian army didn't get involved until May. Sorry. The Haganah offensive was already beginning in April. Uh, I might be mixing it up between the the sec the the uh, Jerusalem being cut off. I'm not even talking about Jerusalem being cut off. I'm talking about mostly the. Uh, what I was talking about with the Jordanian stuff was like the Jerusalem being cut off. 
Um, and that also might have to do with the Iraqi um, irregulars. Yeah, Jerusalem but being cut off about... was like the big the big problem at the beginning. Yeah, until they eventually yeah. got Castle in April, and then yeah, th- I think from then on there was like it was pretty fucking. Once they yeah, once sailing, they broke yeah. through that, I think everything was easy sailing. For and that them. was a like couple literally. months into the war, and that was after the first ceasefire. Is what I was talking about the beginning this, of the war. But this um, was even was, wasn't the, it been like the USA? Then the USA said that, that that Israel will not last more than two years, and that they they were already starting to like uh, figure out uh, draft plans on uh, supporting the Arab states so they could have uh, influence. Well, yeah, I don't the Arab, anybody like, even cared about that much influence in that region yet, no. Yeah, but I, I think you. Um, I'm gonna. I'll send you this later once I'm home. But uh, there was like a, a CIA document that was released that talked about um, the United States position on Israel and how they thought they were going to lose. Like I'm. I'm. So I'm not exaggerating when I said that the um, Israeli defensive looked very grim at the beginning of the war and only through their like, uh, basically this hire not to fucking die and completely restructure their army and coming up with a new strategy. I think they're like, their airports were completely bombed by Egypt. Um, like there was all sorts of trouble at the beginning of the war. I don't know what's happening that's, with your timeline. So you're saying they didn't get into the, ev- the offensive until after the first truce, but the first truce was May. And uh, again, like the big offensive with uh, was it Operation... I'm mostly Whatever the fuck the it's called was April. Um, or um, Egypt. Yeah, I'm I'm mostly uh, focusing on like the offensive against Egypt, not even the Jordanian one. But that was, okay. uh, but that was, I gotta also get more digest more about the the exact timeline on the Jordanian stuff. But I was mostly focusing on like the Egyptian front and like the Sinai and the capturing uh the pushing towards Tel Aviv by the Egyptian forces, which was before the yeah. um before the first ceasefire. Okay um what else is there Mm, you you said something else what was it or strong because you you, you, uh you called me out loner box said i was making some shit up or something or you completely disagreed what else did you disagree with me about about 48 it was mostly about you talking about the intentions of the uh arab leaders and the arab uh, armies and saying that it was at least ethnic cleansing. When you say at least ethnic cleansing, it sounds like you're saying more likely genocide. And you invoked that quote as well from General Secretary about the massacres thing, even yep. though that quote doesn't really tell you anything about what that guy generally believed. Um, and how he was perceived Wait, even by... Uh, even, how, even how he was received by Ben-Gurion himself. Like, you know. Yeah, but I mean, he clearly was not for any Israeli state whatsoever. And he clearly was talking about if there was a war, there would be momentous massacres and uh, uh, like the Mongolians and shit. Like, I don't think that I was trying to uh, someone else try to uh, tell me after that I was talking shit and then showing me that, like, there was more context. But the context didn't really change anything. It was it was clear that that's what he meant. That like the context they, is him hyperbolizing so to try and avoid war. a war because what he wanted was an Arab state with Jews as living as an ethnic minority. That's what he wanted. As far as um, wanting to even it, to it remove them I, again, even well, not even Dimi. No, equal citizens. He said he didn't say Dimi. I don't I, know why you added that in. Like I, it's so obvious that your bias is just like like inserting things that I aren't am there. Biased. Like Ben Gurion. Yeah, I'm like not the fact is, is that. Anything. The fact is, is that throughout, again, a, like a year into him giving that quote in that newspaper, uh, Ben Gurion described him as one of the most like uh, compassionate and like reasonable Arab leaders, or maybe even the most. So yeah, it just seems to be that he was like he was taking a very anti-war stance and hyperbolizing to avoid it. But as far as like going from that one quote to a actual intention to a military, uh, like to an actual policy or plan, it's just you're you've got fucking worlds between each of these stages. Um, yeah. Okay. Okay. Maybe I'll look for more. Uh, I'll look for more quotes uh, from the other Arabic leaders. There are a couple uh, more quotes that you can probably find, but the fact is, is that like by the time the war starts, you've got the Jordanians don't really want to fight at all unless it's over Jerusalem. The Egyptians uh, wait, are. I have liter- a question. If, huh? Do you think that if if you think that they if they captured all of the Israel, they would give them equal status citizenship? Is that what you're? claim is um well the fact is we don't know maybe I, maybe okay, not like I, there's good reason be, to think they realistic. would there's there's good reasons to no but what do you mean be realistic we don't know um like 
this is why people have that same skepticism when it comes to what were the Israeli plans for the removal of Arabs, right? It's like, you can say they said a lot of shit, but again, we don't, yeah. Um, the, the problem with doing historical counterfactuals is we tend to superimpose onto the past attitudes in the future. Um, the, the Arabs would have absolutely genocided every single Palestinian if the Arabs had the mindset from 67 in 48 after losing that much. But if they would have managed to win that very first war, well, the entire international landscape changes. It might be that maybe they want to genocide the Jews, but maybe with pressure from the Soviet Union, somebody like, hey, listen, you guys are about to get invaded. All your shit is going to get fucked. If you don't stop, you just destroyed a country. And the Arabs at that point might be like, okay, well, chill. We'll just like divide this all and like be chill and not genocide. That could be the case because of the international pressure, right? Maybe we should look at the areas that had Jewish people and the armies passed through. How many Jews were left over in? Um, well, yeah, but that was this is Kfar Is after. that the one you're going to use? Like some of them, sometimes like a few hundred were kept no, no, no. as POWs. Like um, some, yeah, sometimes there were massacres. Stay, how many left were? How many were left to stay in um, Jordanian occupied territories taken from Israel? How many were left to stay in? Uh, Egyptian. Yeah, but, you're, but hold on, but you're, wait, wait, you can't use this as evidence of genocidal intent when this could be evidence of retribution for the outcome of the 48 war, what, right? There weren't 700,000 Israelis wait, ex expelled from I'm not other- Wait, hold on. I'm not talking about, in, I'm not talking about like, okay, so let's say they, they didn't want to, but they wanted to get revenge by doing genocide. I'm talking, I'm, like, I'm not talking yeah, about- Yeah, but if they won in 48, <laughs> if, they, if they won in 48, they wouldn't need to get revenge. They would have won, right? In victory, they, they might have- revenge for all the what if they want to get revenge for all the attacks that Israel did for them wanting to even have the audacity to create a state? I, I don't I don't think the drive there is going to be the same as the humiliation they ex they felt by losing to fucking Jews in 48 and a war when they're Arabs. It's unbelievable. The thing is that we, we know how Arab leaders treated Jews who they had control over it because after the war, like, yeah, there were uh, like about a million Jews living in different Arab countries. There was no policy of genocide against them. They were treated very badly. They were treated as second class citizens. Sometimes there were pogroms. Sometimes those pogroms were actually condemned by the local leaders. Even um, Azam Pasha, the guy who said that there will be massacres and all that, condemned a pogrom like two years earlier before the war. Um, there was not even a policy of ethnic cleansing apart from Egypt was the only place where they had the actually an actual policy of removing local Jews who they applied to like maybe 500 or a thousand people. So yeah, we, we, we I think have that, a rough indication. I guess I think when they release the record. Wait, 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 just because there's no to go back and forth on this. Okay. And okay. And loaner box, I'm going to speak for both of us and you can correct me if I'm wrong. I think that hey. me and loaner box will say, is it possible they would have genocided them? Absolutely. It's possible. But can we say that with 100% certainty? It's so hard Even to I'm develop that counterfactual. That. Okay. Well then, then, then we all probably roughly agree. It's possible they could have, and they definitely express some genocidal intent. Sure. Um, but it's also possible that if Israel would have made way more progress on the Egyptian front or on the Syrian front, maybe they would have pushed all the way to Damascus. Maybe they would have pushed all the way to Cairo. Maybe the, the, all the Arabs in these cities would have been expelled. Who knows? Right. But like that, that counterfactual is such a macro and there's so much stuff that's going to change internationally and on the ground that it's hard to say with certainty what would have happened past that point. Maybe with a slightly right. shifted without, cabinet. Without record, maybe with a slightly without records, okay. it's really hard to do any counterfactual or see what the actual true intent was. Um, I, I, like, I can't really make a convincing argument like that much without the like even statements that are like, genocidal it, there's a lot of like overhyping of wars and i agree that that can happen so it's really hard to say what the true true intent of the arabic side will be without seeing like records of what they were trying to do etc um so, based yeah. on what we have with yeah, actual records like a, a slightly different cabinet in 67 would have ethnically cleansed uh, gaza and the west bank if there were some people who wanted to do it so, uh... okay any other uh, contentions, my fellow orbiter, Mr. Lonerbox? <laughs> no, you're like a meteor, right? No. Okay. Oh, he is. He is. He is my orbiter. I'm not even talking about you, Mr. Oh. Destiny. I let him come uh, talk to me sometimes. You know. Wow. Wow. Uh, I think I'm satisfied. Do you have I anything for I us, as well. Dustin? Um, did you enjoy PV? You have the line. How did it go compared to other events that you've been to? Um, I don't think I talked to you much about a lot of the drama stuff going on. I actually, the reason why I was a little bit hesitant to promote it on stream is I thought that event was going to self destruct. I thought that it was going to be the culmination of like three or four different dramatic things that were going on behind the scenes. So that was my expectation. Although. I thought it went incredibly well. I thought it was like an amazingly ran managed event. Kyle did an amazing job at managing talent, moving people around, scheduling people. Every part of that moved 
way smoother than I thought. I think it was easily the smoothest event that we've done. So yeah, I was really happy. Felt pretty smooth. Um, mm -hmm. Oh fuck, what was I gonna, uh, yeah, as far as drama, all I heard was, um, I saw a video from President Sunday called the downfall of progressive victory or some shit. And I just mm -hmm. thought, oh, it's President Sunday. It's probably nothing at all, like some autistic bullshit. So I um, guess I was right. I don't know. I don't know why there was a downfall before we went in, but yeah. Steven, you, oh. owe, me, you owe me 200 bucks. Why? I won. Because we made a bet. What did we bet on? We bet about the canvassing event. Oh, yeah, I did bet you that it was going to be fucking horrible. Did you bet it was going to be a He said failure? he bet that it was going to be a failure. Yep, I did. Jesus, I, what a I, peasant. You, I thought it was you owe me hard. 200 bucks. All right, I'll add it to your uh, first uh, paycheck compensation for our first episode of Bridges, okay? <laughs> okay, sounds okay. good. <laughs> sounds good. I thought you were betting that I'd be shorter. Shut up. I was betting that you'd be bigger, actually. Ooh. Whoa. Oh. What were you expecting? Like a seven foot fucking. Like, like I, those, heard, I heard those blow up guys that you see in front of car dealerships. What? Yeah, I was. I've heard things about stone giants uh, and Scottish people and something about those two things, probably. I am probably the shortest man in Scotland. Makes sense. Yeah, exactly. That's what I was alluding towards. Is what it is. I want to fuck. Wait, 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 wait. Um, I don't know if I'm allowed to talk about this. So I'll, I'm going to type it to one of you. Just okay. Wait, what? Hang on. Um, don't don't type it to me because I'm I'm not at my computer right now. Okay, I'll type it what, to Dustin. Are you near the horses? Um, Are people speaking about that, Dustin? Hold on. What? No, I don't know about that. Wait, type me more about that. <laughs> okay, I'm back at my computer. Type me more about the day. Okay, <laughs> okay, you. Too late. You didn't want it. I want to know more. No, I'm back. I want to know. <laughs> Oh, wait, 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 don't tell it. Hold on, wait, 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 don't tell it. Hold on, I'm trading. No, wait, fuck wait, wait. Him. he's gonna troll me. You have no, to. No, no, I'm not. Hold on. Wait. Oh, this is so juicy. <laughs> yeah, I need to know that. Tell me that, and then I'll trade you. Don't I tell can't me. Tell you. Not, not right now, though. Obviously. Okay, well, I'll we'll tell you, tell you this thing in the future. I'll tell you this. No later. shot. Loaderbox yes! message me. No. no! Fuck Loader. you. You're Loader. gonna be decommissioned from Loader. Yes. Loader. I'm not saying anything. Oh, ha, fuck you. That's way less juicy. Oh, my God. <laughs> um, pro probably not yet. I don't know. I don't know. Oh, he's a lot. Okay. All right. Anything else? I need Wait. to do my shit. I do. Okay. I do have something else. I oh, want to... Oh, what? I wanted to um try to give my grand narrative on the settlements and the reasoning for them and the like why they happen and, and like okay go. If you go like, fast without yeah go grand narrative okay so i feel like with the things like jerusalem i don't think that they started at all like because of the, the, the great war of 67 i think for a long time they did want to have east jerusalem it was extremely important like the western wall and whatnot um i think annexing that was always the plan I think at the same time, there's this problem with like um, a bunch of people that want to move into settlements. And then the um, Israeli government just, ah, eh, fuck it. Um, you think that's probably going to be a fear in Gaza is that um, regardless of how not it doesn't have majority support, but it doesn't need it, right? It doesn't need majority support for a bunch of crazy settlers to go into Israel-occupied Gaza, so long as the government just doesn't want to use force to remove them. So that could be a problem, but I think that the international pressure from the entire world is so focused right now that even if in uh, uh, Netanyahu's best world, he's going to end up doing that, that's not going to end up actually happening. So you agree uh, that we I might need some international pressure to fucking nudge them out if they decide to try it? Because they will try it. I, I think absolutely. that's 100% sure that some people will try it. They will try, try it. what? 
some some right wing Israelis uh, will try to settle in Gaza under Israeli occupation. I feel like it's just so stupid. And like Gaza, no offense, Gaza sucks. Like there's not like holy shit there. It's not Judea and Samaria. It's not like the Brutal. cringe biblical shit that all these fucking cringe loser Zionists are like super obsessed with. I don't think anybody gives a fuck. Yeah, it does about, suck. Uh, but there's the right wingers have a big fucking national trauma about uh, Gush Katif, and there are people literally fucking camping outside the wall, being like, "We're ready to go back in." Gush Katif is that one of the settlements that was taken down in 2005 yeah. or four? Yeah, that, that, yeah, that, that is the big yeah, yeah, but, who, but like. Like, who cares? Uh, I, I so, think they'd rather just continue to settle more and more of the West Bank. Yeah. So that wasn't even like part of the original like Jewish kingdom or blah, 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 whatnot. But um, that was somewhere that they did live for like hundreds of years in like modern times, the like the before the Aliyah and stuff. So there's yeah, some shit got, about that. Bro, but, they've like, got they've been like, they got another place. Yeah, I agree. There are some people who hold on to the fact that there were Jews in Gaza up until 1929 when a bunch of them had to get fucked off because of the violence. Okay, like some people. Yeah, again, I'm just saying there are people who are clearly talking about it and who have like are uh, protesting quite physically outside the border because they want to go and do it. Like, I'm just saying it, they'll probably get removed because Netanyahu doesn't want to deal with that. But fuck, it's like it's not like a non thing. I don't know. It's Palestinians have security Nothing. concerns as well, you know. Do you th wait? Do you think no one's going to try, or do you think like they will try and they'll get fucked out? Oh, I I think some people will try to cross the border and they'll get fucked out from okay. the beginning. I don't I even think it'll get to that. the stage with international pressure. Okay. Um, that's all. Yeah. All right. Bye bye. Enjoy your stream. All right. What do you think is like? So the war after the war ends. So it looks like Israel is gearing up to head south. Um. Mm -hmm. Let's say they go, they do their southern sweep. Once they finish their operation, they have to leave, or or, or the major military operations have to end. Like, what do you, where does Israel go from here? I don't know. I uh, I don't. I know they want other Arab countries to get involved and to take some of that burden, but I don't think they're actually going to do it. Why the fuck would Egypt or Qatar or any of these people like go into Gaza? Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know. I think. Um, I, th I I don't know. I feel like if I could see if I could be a fly on the wall in the Israeli cabinet, I'd probably see them just being like, you know, maybe they'll leave. Maybe the Palestinians. I feel like yeah. Leave. I feel like October seventh helps them extend the status quo so much. Mm -hmm. Like they get so much international authority. Maybe not with like young kids or whatever, but it, it's just such an easy. It's like their new Holocaust, basically. Like for yeah. them to portray themselves as victims and just capitalize on that and continue to expand. Yeah, I have no idea. I think it's going to it's going to require like the the only good outcome comes from a lot of international involvement whether it's from the United States or the UN or from Saudi or Qatar or but like none of these countries are going to have any interest in doing that. Um so the know. Palestinians like really need a cohesive leader representative. It I think that's what the hardest thing right now. Um I think that's the hardest thing right now. Yeah. Do you think here's an idea cuz I'm trying to the more that I like looked at the maps, the more that I thought about the situation, the one state solution would just be so good if it would work. It eliminates every weird, cuck, stupid fucking problem. Do you think there's any chance that like the Knesset can oh fuck. Does Israel even have a fucking constitution? Isn't the way their yeah, founding document do, yeah. shit works? Do they? Okay. Cause I thought they had a weird way of adding rules to where they don't tech they just have like their founding document or there's some weird cuck shit. I'm sure they, they must have some kind of way to. Well, like, they have like a decl their declaration of independence. I don't think it's like a. It's not a constitution. It's like a founding. Yeah, but like, I mean, I think they have so. like initial laws or something, but I don't think they mm. have like a formal constitution. But I'm sure they've got some kind of ultimate authority document. Um, I, I wonder if there is some way that they can enshrine like certain rules into the, um, into the Israeli like legal system mm -hmm. that need like an 85% vote to overturn and then just start annexing or creating basically a unified state. So even if they were like a 50, 50 demographics, they're not going to, you know, get voted into non-existence or some crazy shit. Yeah. Um, the, the cons I don't think the constitutional difficulties would be the big thing. I think the big thing would be the fact that, um, military representation with a 50 50 odd split would be very very difficult given that um the amount of like r fighting that's happened between the two groups and also just the fact that neither side wants to know each other they don't want like most of them don't ever want to talk to each other even palestinians who work in israel they go there they work they go home um mm -hmm. like they don't like want to learn each other's language they don't give a fuck about each other's history um th yeah i think that's more the big issue is like how the fuck would these guys live in a shared political process i do think that isn't impossible to change um 
at a very micro level, I've definitely noticed that one of the most disarming things when Israelis and Palestinians talk to each other is when one person tries to say, oh, well, do you have any idea what it's like having to deal with a checkpoint and having a gunpoint in your face? And then the Israeli might say, uh, no, but I did lose like two friends in the fucking second intifada. And then it's like, and then everyone's suddenly like, oh, shit. And then suddenly both people are quite fucking like humbled by that. Or if it goes the other way around as well, right? Um, mm -hmm. But how you so i don't, i don't think it's impossible but there just needs to be like some will to achieve like working on that and that would just take such a long time so i don't know i think if um i feel like if barkuti came back and he was like a big shot politician in palestine and he started saying this is what we want like one person one vote and all that shit i'd probably support it but I don't know. I don't know if it would also just get him killed. <laughs> so yeah. Do you feel like the Do you feel like the PA can continue, or do you think it has to be completely dismantled and something new erected? I don't know because it's like I don't know if it, it's rotten to the core or if it's just the fact that I think um, it's rotten to the core. I think when Arafat was the head of it, the way that it maintained its cohesion was people were bribed. It was always seen as corrupt. Mm -hmm. It was always seen as a political tool, basically for Arafat to ensure his control over Palestinians and to maintain some kind of support from them. Um, by being the the negotiator against Israel and the representative of the hopes and dreams, like it, I think it feels like it's always been fucked in the eyes of the Palestinians. They've never liked the PA. Yeah, that's true. But whether or not it's just because of leadership, or if it's something that actually yeah is institutionally wrong with it, probably because of the whole area A, B, and C thing, and even like the way they collect taxes and shit is like yeah, um, yeah, kind of rife for for corruption. Um, I don't know, but then again, I don't I don't actually know how much. This is a really weird thing to say. I don't know how much Palestinians um, at least have like democracy as a high priority. Like if they'd rather just be under like a leader that they find generally like strong and like um, convincing, because obviously like a lot of the other Arab countries don't have democracies. But I guess because yeah. Palestine, the Palestinians have had that system in the past, maybe they want it more. Uh, I don't know. Wait, have they had that in the past? Or well, they, they, when they, they voted the for Arafat. election for yeah, yeah. they voted for Arafat. They, they voted for Abbas. They voted for the wait. Did Hamas they vote for Arafat? Thing. I thought Arafat just was involved in the creation of the PLO. What no, they had they elections. The... Yeah, um, they had elections. Uh, yeah, in but 19... I mean, like four ninety five. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But he was already so popular because of like non democratic. He was. He, who else would they have voted for besides Arafat? Was uh, it well, Fatah that he fought with sometimes? Or? It was no. Well, he was in. He was the leader of Fatah. But there was also um, like the DFLP were running and. Uh, oh, true. But, yeah, that's the, the, Wait, the, what is the relationship? It's the, Fatah is part of the PLO, which mm -hmm. became the administrator of the PA. Is that the... Yeah. Okay. Fatah is the right. party, yeah. Um, gotcha, gotcha. And yeah, Hamas boycotted that election, but like, Arafat won like 90% of the vote, and it was a fair and free election. So mm -hmm. uh, then obviously you get to 2004 or uh, five, uh, Abbas becomes president with a democratic vote, and then Hamas wins the parliamentary in 2006. So mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, they've had elections and they've... Uh, they got the result that they wanted twice, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Well, who knows? I think even with polling, though, because Hamas boycotted that election, uh, as did all the other rejectionists, I think even then, even with all those other opposition candidates in, I think uh, Arafat would have probably still won like 40% of the vote in 95. So. Well. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. It seems like the direction right now is not good it's also but, very unpredictable right i don't know if that helps or not because well it seems kind of predictable in that it's heading for another explosive point because like there is no solution to the um refugee problem the un is ensured that that is intractable that's mm -hmm. tied to the resolution of israel and palestine um, at this point, Israel has signed bilateral agreements with so many other Arab states that hate Palestinians. Egypt has no desire to do anything with them. Jordan doesn't want to do anything with them. Um, they have foreign support from people that hate the Saudi-Israeli axis. Like, Israel doesn't want to do anything, it seems. Palestinians can't or don't want to do anything. Like, it just seems fucked. Like, when we say unpredictable, I don't even know, like, what could change to make things different. I don't even know where the change would come from. Like, um, I feel like... It's kind of encouraging to see Biden actually being a lot harder on Israel with the sanctions and the settlers and just like the public statements, because we haven't really had that from an American president since like Bush senior, I guess. Um, there might be something there. And then maybe if Palestinians can see that there's that kind of positivity happening from that part of the world, then there might be a shift there. Um, maybe. Wait, hold on a second.
Okay, sorry. Um, huh. But yeah, I don't know. I came here to talk about history because I don't know dick about what to do right now. <laughs> so okay. that's my safe space. Have you followed a lot from like, do you know a lot from like 2005 to like, do you know a lot about protection, protective edge and cast lead and all that bullshit? No, or? I mean, like, no. what do I need to know about that? Like, uh, well, I'm curious if the behavior of the Israeli army is as bad as like Finkelstein claims it is. I'm, I don't believe anything he says after the factioning I've done from some of the few things he says, but I'm curious. I mean, I mean, I what are the, what are the death tolls for cast lead and protective edge? It was like 1500 for cast lead, I think, in, tw in the space of just under a month. Um, and I think it was 2,000 dead in Protective Edge in the space of a month. I, uh, yeah, I, I don't, I don't know. I think, um, I've heard from IDF dudes that, like, they, they think that Israel's whole thing then was going above and beyond the law and, like, basically using the same guidelines that NATO does for, like, collateral damage and shit. But, um, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't think the whole, like, dispute between the Goldstone report and, um, the counter to it where I think like Goldstone made a few very, very silly mistakes where they um, misread certain things about like Israeli doctrine when it came to like, what was one of the, one of the accusations was that Goldstone said Israel was counting all police officers in Gaza as militants, oh, even though yeah. they actually weren't uh, according to the source that they'd used. So yeah, I don't know. I don't know if there's anything too exciting to look at there. Maybe I heard that Israel okay. violated more ceasefires than Hamas did. So who knows? Mm -hmm. Yeah, ceasefire stuff with the, when the sides aren't truly ready for peace seems like kind of a meme. I think even in 48 um, and in 67, I think every time there's like a ceasefire, there's a lot of shenaniganery that's going on. Um, yeah. Like, I don't because... know if people are aware of this, but like during a ceasefire, I don't think you're even allowed to strategically reposition troops. Like, I think it's just like, I don't even know if you're allowed to resupply troops, but when you move stuff around, um, yeah, that's technically a violation of the ceasefire. So, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's why I think I, I can't remember if it was Protective Edge or Cast Lead, but it was a ceasefire violation from Israel that was done. But this thing that they'd broken the ceasefire to hit was a tunnel that had gone yes. further past the no buff, the no go zone. Mm -hmm. the no, the buffer I think zone. that was pro for yeah. Protective Edge. I think that's how that started. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know. It's probably good on the propaganda stage, but thought. Yeah. Okay. What is that? What your what's your Finkelstein? debate going to be on is there like a topic or is it just broadly? i want to read i'm wasting time i should be i should be doing it now you're wasting time uh, but i want to read that inquest into martyrdom um and then i just want to start hunting down every footnote and i want to figure out um i really should maybe i'll do this today i need to figure out what the big questions are um this would go under debate you know israel the Palestine. the well, i think big questions would be like um, like who's like whose fault was the Nakba, or or who shares responsibility mm -hmm. for the Nakba would be a big part. Um, in '67, it would be like who shares responsibility for the Six Day War. Um, it's gonna be big macro level questions like this. Uh, I don't know. What can you think of any that you would want debated between? Um, scholars the way that the way that Mr. Finkelstein talks about fucking uh, international law is, I feel like he cites it in a very like dubious way, he with does, the human shields thing. Or yeah, yeah, yes. yeah. Um, I know he is very much of the whole wing that believes that Hamas did actually have a very moderated stance between sort of two thousand and eight and, uh, or even between two thousand five six and. Uh, now i guess do you know anything about this like not just the revised charter but also like uh the idea that even them participating in elections counted as them implicitly accepting the conditions for those elections which was the pa existing which existed on the basis of recognizing israel and uh wanting a peaceful solution do you know any of that or um no not as much i yeah, mean i had it. heard that they moderated their charter a bit but i'd have to check so that, that's a there's a whole from yeah from 2006 7 all the way up until 2022 basically or 23 there's this whole idea that hamas were like trying their best to moderate and israel just not having it and israel just aggressing on uh, gaza and forcing hamas to radicalize that's like a very uh finkelstein kind of position hmm. what year was this this would be from 2006 onwards, I would imagine. Yeah. Well, basically, since they participated in the election, which would be 2006. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, a good counter to that, I guess, would be if you look at when, when Hamas says that they're open to peace, usually they would say 
there's one quote from them i wonder i think the quote from them is saying that they're uh, interested in peace around the mid 2000s is them saying um well, first of all, we want a complete withdrawal from the 67 borders. We want a state in the 67 borders. We want a uh, return of refugees, um, uh, implementation of, yeah, implementation of right return, destroying the wall, removing all the settlements, releasing the prisoners, and then we'll discuss peace. Like, it's that kind of fucking shit, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, like, we'll do a ceasefire if you give us every, release every single Palestinian prisoner, et cetera, et cetera, yeah. Yeah, and the thing about the revised charter, I mean, the guy who revised it and said that, like, we're a different party now and all that, he is still there, but he lost his leadership position, like, just a few maybe i think it was actually a few days after the charter uh -huh. came out but yeah it never sure. like formally supplanted the old one yeah lots of but yeah that would be a good thing to look into um his um was so benny morris was okay with um being up against two like scholars and then with you yeah i think benny morris has actually debated what are you wait that's Excuse not a fucking me, insult what? i just thought academics would Excuse be more me, like what? uh listen if finkelstein can call himself a scholar i can call myself a scholar okay Fuck okay him. Cool. But yeah, he was fine with it, surprisingly so. But I think he's debated Finkelstein in the past, and yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, I'd look forward to it. Sounds like a banger. I know Benny Morris is very unapologetic about the 1948 war. Um, yeah. His whole I mean, thing his, is like... like uh, his... Oh, God. Yeah, because I think even... Uh, there's one article from 2008 where he... Um, puts like the refugees in quotation marks and he's saying yeah, well the refugees who had basically just fought a war against them like declared war as if like all 700,000 of them were fell under that category and like like saying that the barring of their return and the because they feared the refugees becoming a fifth column to destroy Israel and he was basically saying like I can't fault their reasoning or their logic and anything like that so yeah I think mm -hmm. he's quite unapologetic about it and I think once he's even said that they should have gone further like they should have taken all of it and that would have been like well I think yeah I think his feeling was after off, 2004 yeah. he was saying that like yeah the biggest fault that Israel ever committed was that they didn't just ethnically cleanse or expel all of them <laughs> yeah so I don't know how much I agree with that but yeah fucking I mean, it would have simplified the situation today, but yeah, obviously. It I sad could and, uh, have, yeah. but yeah, I, I, it's one of those things where even if you could prove that it would have been a better situation for everyone, like if they did that, it's like still you're making the, at the time you're making the decision to just like ethnically cleanse even further. Like, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I guess like Ben Gurion like, quite rightly, I think, said no, because I think they could have taken the West Bank and Gaza back then. But mm, maybe, yeah, I think, I think the whole international was... community was kind of freaking out, though, right? Like yeah. they wanted people to calm the fuck down. Yeah. And um, yeah. And it basically allowed Ben Gurion to say that, like, that they were good in good faith pursuing peace after the war, even though that's not necessarily true or not as simple as he put it. I think even for a while, Ben Gurion just lied to the international community about uh, he had this line where he would constantly say that not a single Arab was expelled. So um, sure. like none of them. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I would look forward to seeing that. Okay. Cool. All right, All right I'll leave you to it, okay? Um, okay, I love you, buddy. Take care, bye-bye.